Welcome back to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan Grek, and on today's episode, something I am really excited about. This is a feature of the Jeep Gladiator that I think brings it up to the next level. So back before I drove around Africa in 2015, I designed and built a dual isolated battery setup with solar that worked really well for Africa. It was great. But 2015 was a long time ago. Lots of things have changed. And now I've designed, and on today's episode, I'm going to build what I'm calling 21st century dual isolated batteries. This is better in essentially every single way than the system I had previously. So I'm really excited about this. I actually enjoy 12 volt wiring, and I can't wait to see how this system performs out in the real world. So if you're thinking about a dual isolated battery setup for your vehicle, maybe even with solar, stick around. I've got tons of information to give you about the design of this thing, and then we'll get into actually building it. So I've done a video previously about dual isolated batteries. And at the really highest level, what it means is you add an additional battery to your vehicle so that you can run things like your fridge, charge all your camera equipment, run a water pump or anything like that. And if that battery gets depleted, you haven't touched the battery that actually starts and runs your engine. So that's the isolation. The two batteries are actually separate from each other. One runs the vehicle, one runs your fridge and all of that kind of stuff. Usually the vehicle battery is called the starter battery, makes the engine start. And your second one is usually called the house battery because it runs all your house things like a fridge, like anything else you wanna plug in that might use a lot of electricity. So they're isolated like that, they're separate from each other. But usually you have some sort of system that joins them together because when your engine's running, you've got the alternator on the front of your engine that can charge up not only your starter battery, but you can also use it to charge your house battery. So when your engine's running, you want them together, that way they both get charged by the alternator. When you turn your engine off, disconnect them again, isolate them from each other so they're separate. That's basically dual isolated batteries. And for extra fun or extra complexity, most of us add solar panels into this mix. So we really want also to charge our house battery from the solar panel when we're not driving at all. Let's say we wanna camp somewhere for a week without running the engine. We obviously still want our fridge to be cold, keep all our nice drinks ready to go. So we need solar panels to keep that house battery full, even if we're not actually running the engine and using the alternator. So like I said, the setup I designed for Africa, it worked really well. It uses a big solenoid, which is kind of like a switch to either have the batteries joined together or have the batteries separate from each other. Back then in 2015, cutting edge was kind of gel batteries or big old school deep cycle batteries. And I had two of those mounted under the hood of my Jeep. One as the starter, one as the house battery. The system worked, but I do think there's a lot of room for improvement, which I've got here in front of me. And the first thing that I've improved in this design is the battery that I'm going to be using. So sitting here in front of me, this is a 50 amp hour lithium ion phosphate battery from Renergy Solar. And the first thing you're gonna notice about this battery is it is light. So this is exactly half the weight and half the size of the 50 amp hour house battery that I used when I drove around Africa. So this thing, I've got the specs here in front of me, it weighs 6.7 kilograms or 14.7 pounds. For 50 amp hours, that is absolutely incredible. You can also see how small it is. So, you know, think of a typical battery, it would be twice as big as this, but here I have 50 amp hours. And for me, I think 50 amp hours is plenty of capacity. That's actually what I had in my house battery for around Africa, and it was ample. Here, of course, in Australia, there will also be plenty of sunshine, so I'll always have lots of solar. I do plan on doing a lot of driving on this trip, probably more driving days than resting days. As well as that, the charge controller that I'll get into a minute is much more efficient at actually charging the house battery. So I'm confident that it will always be topped up, even if I only go for a relatively short drive. 
And of course, it's really important to remember, more battery capacity is not necessarily a good thing. You'll be using up payload and using up storage space if you think that 100 or 200 or 300 amp hours is better. If you don't have need of it, it doesn't make your vehicle better because you're gonna to have to compromise in some other way. So make sure when you're sizing your batteries, don't fall into the trap of just thinking bigger is better. Do some homework, do some research, and figure out what's right for your needs because that's more important than simply having a bigger number. And I know there's a lot of dual battery kits out there that can be mounted under the hood of my Gladiator or of any other vehicle, but modern vehicles like this, it actually already has two batteries that deal with starting the engine. There's the main one as you think of it, and then underneath it, there's another one, and it's used for the engine start, stop, it's used in a bunch of complicated scenarios. And so lots of the kits out there on the market, they have to kind of mess with all of that stuff, rewire a ton of the factory setup, moving batteries around, and they can just manage to cram two batteries in that space under the hood. What I've decided to do though is something entirely different from that. This time around, I'm going to leave all of that 100% factory. I don't wanna mess with any of that, and I don't want my battery to be under the hood having to deal with the engine heat, the dust, the mud, all of the stresses of being in that environment. I think with this battery, I'm gonna mount it inside the vehicle where it won't have as severe weather conditions and it will perform better because of that and it will last longer because of that. So in my mind, leaving all of that factory complication alone, I don't wanna to touch it. I don't wanna deal with cramming things into tight spaces. Instead, mount the battery inside the vehicle and keep it much simpler and much more straightforward. In that way, wiring this thing together is really simple and this is totally something that you can do at home without trouble. So after the battery, the next thing is you guys have already seen my 100 watt solar panel. Again, this is from Renergy Solar and I chose to go with a flexible panel this time because it is so, so light. Again, I'm always thinking about payload and I'm always thinking about where do I wanna spend my payload budget? In reality, I wanna be able to bring more fuel, more food and more water so that I can get more remote. And of course, have more enjoyment with tasty food and cold beverages in the fridge. I don't wanna spend all of my payload budget on having the world's biggest solar array and the world's biggest battery bank. That's not gonna make my trip better. So for me, a lightweight solar panel is ideal for my needs. And then the final piece of this puzzle is what's called the charge controller, or you can think of this as the brains of the entire operation. So essentially what we do is we wire the starter battery to this thing, we wire the house battery to this thing, and we wire the solar panels into this, and it takes care of everything. And this unit from Renergy Solar, this is their 30 amp DC to DC charge controller with built-in MMPT solar. What does all of that mean? Let's go over it one step at a time. First of all, 30 amps means that's how much current that it can charge the house battery at. And it has a lot of different ways it can do that. In its simplest form, if you're driving in the dark or if you don't have solar panels, this is a DC to DC charge controller. So what that does is it takes the voltage from the alternator and it steps it up or steps it down, does whatever is necessary to then push it into the house battery at the most optimal rate. And it can do that 30 amps at a time. So that's a lot of current that it can flow. And you can buy this unit in 50 amps as well. So it could actually do it at a 50 amp rate and that's mega. That's gonna charge this battery really fast. Now, if you're driving along on a nice sunny day, obviously your solar panel is collecting power. And why would you use the alternator if you can have the sun for free? Whenever you take power from the alternator, you're putting extra load on the engine, which is gonna hurt your gas mileage. So what this unit does, this is really smart, it will prioritize whatever power it can take from the solar panel. So if it's a super sunny day, let's say you can get all 15 amps out of your solar panel, it'll pull 15 from the solar panel and 15 from the alternator, and then feed that into the house battery at 30 amps. Another scenario, suddenly you drive through a tunnel, now there's no solar, the unit will recognize that immediately, nothing from the solar panel, it'll start bringing in 30 amps from the alternator, still charging the house battery at that 30 amps. You drive out of the tunnel, 
Oh, there's solar again. Let's ramp up the amount we're pulling from the solar panel and ramp down the amount we're getting from the alternator. This unit does that all the time on the fly automatically. That's really good to have. Of course, another mode of operation is you're just parked in the sun on a sunny day. And so there's no power from the alternator to be had. So this unit will take as much power as it can or as much as it needs to from the solar panel and push it straight into the house battery. And this is an MMPT solar charge controller. Basically, that means it's the most efficient kind that there is. There's another kind which is kind of old and outdated now. So this is the one you want. And here's a feature that this thing really stands out in my mind. Not only will it charge your house battery off the solar, but let's say you leave your vehicle parked for five days in camp. You know, the house battery is running your fridge, it's running all your charges, all your extra stuff. But let's say occasionally you put the music on in the vehicle, you're opening the doors and the lights are on. Then your starter battery is going down a little bit as well, slowly. This unit will sense that and it will trickle charge the starter battery off the solar panels automatically all by itself. I really like that it has that feature and it just does it automatically. So really what that means is this unit is a DC to DC charge controller and it's a solar charge controller all in one unit. You don't need to buy two separate units. And to be quite honest with you, one of the major reasons I chose it is because it costs $250 for all of that capability. So there are other brands on the market, especially here in Australia, Red Arc is a popular brand because they're made in Australia. Those units cost three, four, five times as much money as this unit does. And actually some of them don't even have all of the features that this one does. Again, if you look at SeaTech, different brands out there, they cost a lot more money. And I had a Renogy charge controller for three years around Africa and it's been absolutely flawless. So I know these units are up to the task. I know they're high quality. And that's one of the major reasons that I've chosen the Renogy. Another great feature of this charge controller is that it actually has a built-in temperature compensation unit. So it comes with a temperature probe, which you mount onto the battery. And based on the temperature of the battery, the charge controller will vary how quickly it's charging the battery. Because obviously, if it's really warm, it maybe doesn't want to get charged as fast. So in order to preserve the life of the battery and do the most optimal thing at the time, it will compensate based on the temperature. Another really well thought out feature of the charge controller is that there's kind of no point putting a screen on it because screens cost a lot of money, especially if you want to display a good amount of information. And let's be honest, we all already have screens with us all the time anyway, that's right, your cell phone. So this unit, you can buy a Bluetooth module for it. You plug it into Bluetooth, and then there's a free app on your phone that you can use to monitor what's actually happening. So in real time, it will give you all the information about how much current is currently flowing from the alternator into the house battery, how much from the solar panels into the house battery, how the entire system is performing. And because it's on your phone, what it means is you can mount this unit anywhere you like. It doesn't have to be somewhere you can actually see it because you never need to look at it. It can be tucked away in a storage cabinet or behind a seat or wherever you want because when you need to monitor it or you wanna check how things are performing, you just sit anywhere near the vehicle and check it on your phone. I think that's really smart because otherwise you're just paying money for yet another display that really isn't actually that useful. And so I am working with Renogy Solar. I worked with them before on my Africa trip and now again. And what they've done is they've put together a discount code for their website. So if you click the link in the description, head over to their website, every product except batteries with the checkout code of TRCM for The Road Chose Me. So TRCM gets you a 10% discount on everything in the store. So when I said this thing was $250, you can take another 25 off that. It's actually only $225 with that code. So make sure you click the link in the description and have a look around. Renogy obviously have a lot of different options. There's a 50 amp version of this same controller. There are 100 amp hours of this battery. There's also 160 amp hours, which is enormous. And of course, there's a ton of different solar panels. And then there's all the wiring and all the fuses and all of that kind of stuff you need too. So if you're thinking about a dual isolated battery setup, Renogy really is one-stop shopping. And I genuinely believe this is the best of the best. 
you can't improve on this system, I don't think there's anything better on the market right now. And like I said, this whole setup is quite straightforward to wire together. You don't need a degree in electrical engineering. I really am just going to run a positive and a negative from this unit up to the starter battery. Then I run a positive and a negative over here to the house battery and the solar wires will come in with a positive and negative. And that's it, it's all wired up, ready to go. Okay, so that's a huge amount of preamble. Let's get into putting this all into my Jeep, get it all wired up and get isolated dual batteries. So the first step here to wire up the whole system is to connect the starter battery of the Jeep all the way to the back where I've got the charge controller. And to do that, I need to run a positive and a negative wire. And technically you could just connect the negative of the charge controller onto the body somewhere because the body is earthed. But I feel like to make sure that everything is perfect, I'm already running one wire up to the battery, I may as well run another. And my charge controller is rated to 30 amps, which means it can pull 30 amps down this wire. So it needs to be substantial. Renergy say to use eight or 10 gauge wire. And here in Australia, I just went to an auto electrician. We talked around it for a few minutes and he recommended that I use six millimeter wire, which is rated to 50 amps. So this is actually overkill. This is rated higher than it needs to be. But when it comes to high current wiring like this, I personally like to err on the side of caution and go a little bit overboard. And this will be fused with a 40 amp fuse. So if something went wrong and if this shorted out, the fuse would blow and it's not actually gonna create a fire or anything like that. But to be even extra safe, I'm going to put this wire inside conduit or spaghetti tube, some people call it. That way it's just protected from rubbing, from vibrations, all of that kind of thing. And I need to lay it down the passenger side of the vehicle, come in from the battery behind the rear seat, down the side, and then I'm gonna push it through the firewall. There's a grommet sort of below the glove box on the Australian Gladiator. Get it through the grommet and then come up and wire it into the starter battery. That's step number one to get this whole system together. All right, here I am in the back seat of the Jeep and I just finished running the wire all the way from the starter battery back here. And so it went through a grommet in the firewall, kind of under the glove box, and then it's actually underneath all of this plastic trim inside that spaghetti tube that I had. And then here it's under the very in the back corner here, under the back seat that's gonna stay. And then this is it here coming up towards my whole wiring area. So uh, important fact, I haven't actually connected the other end yet because if I connected that to the battery, then I'd have 12 volts right here, which would be bad because this would spark or cause trouble with anything it touches. So I'm gonna completely wire up this end before I go and connect the other end. And so I've got these really nice 40 amp fuses. These came from Renergy as well. And so I'm gonna mount those somewhere on the wall, maybe about there. And each of those 12 volt lines goes through a fuse before it goes into the charge controller and then one between the charge controller and the house battery. So I'm pretty cramped here in the back seat, but it's time to get to work making all of this happen. All right, so I've just wired up the positive and the negative coming from the starter battery going into the charge controller. So what I need to do now is I need to make a little cable that goes from here to here with a crimp on every end to finish off that positive connection. I also need to make a positive that comes from the out of the charge controller down to the house battery and a negative as well that goes from the charge controller down to the house battery. And thankfully I can do all of that outside the Jeep. I don't have to sit here in the back seat. All right, so I just made all those little short connections and here's what it looks like now. And I know it looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually really easy when you follow it through. 12 volt wiring isn't too complicated. And you can see the charge controller has come to life now that it's connected to the lithium battery. So one of the things that I think a lot of people find complicated about 12 volt wiring, especially when you have isolated batteries like this, is that the negatives or the black wire is always just connected together. So we call that a common ground or a common earth. And in every system in the Jeep, the negatives, they're always just connected together. 
And you can actually see that here. This is the negative terminal on the charge controller. And so one of these wires is the one that comes from the starter battery right up at the front of the Jeep. And the other one is just connected directly to the negative on the lithium ion battery. So that's just how you do it with 12 volts. Negative is just always negative all the time. And the positive is the one that the unit will connect and disconnect and deal with actually charging. So the easiest thing to do, first of all, is you just connect all your negatives together and you don't have to use fuses for any of that. It's fine, that's just how it works. And then after that, you just have to connect up your positives. And again, it's actually really basic. The positive from the starter battery is coming across the bottom here and it comes into this fuse block. So this is just a 40 amp fuse to protect things, comes out of the fuse block and then into the charge controller where it says uh, alternator plus 12. So that's where the charge controller is going to draw current from the alternator. And then on the other side of the charge controller, this is basically where it puts 12 volts out after it's done its magic with the solar, with the DC to DC converter, all of that kind of magic in the box. It comes out of this 12 volts, goes through another fuse just to be safe, straight out of that fuse and into the 12 volts of the house battery. And that really is it. That is the whole system wired up. There are a couple more things I'll get to in just a second, but essentially that's how easy it is. And the reason I have this big fuse block in the middle here is I'm gonna take 12 volts out of the house battery and come through this fuse block and wire everything on separate fuses. So I'll have a 10 amp fuse for the fridge. I'll have a 10 amp fuse for my water pump. I'll probably have a fuse for some separate lights that I'm going to wire. I'm definitely gonna have a whole bunch of charger outlets for my laptop, for my cameras, for all of that. So I've got six separate circuits here that each have their own individual fuse. And from here, wires will run to wherever they need to go, whether that's in the bed or whether that's here in my storage cabinet. That's what this little block in the middle is for. But the only thing I have to do now, uh, the charge controller has come to life because it's connected to the lithium battery. And I've just been reading through the Renergy manual and basically you have to tell it what kind of battery it's connected to. So you could have a regular old lead acid battery like the starter in your vehicle. You could have a gel battery, which is what I had driving around Africa, or you could have a lithium ion battery. And to set that, I'm just reading the manual here, there's a little button on the side of the charge controller. I push that button and on the front, this little LED changes color to indicate what type of battery I have. And the book says I need to keep pressing until it turns blue. So it's orange, I think that press there, there. So that little LED just turned blue, which means now the system knows it's dealing with a lithium ion battery. So as you know, I have a solar panel as well that I need to connect to this charge controller. And once I permanently mount the roof rack, I'll find a way to get the wires inside here. And it's just as easy to connect as everything else. Here's where the positive input from the solar panel goes. And once again, common negative, it just goes over here with everything else on the negative terminal. But obviously I could run this system as it is right now. I don't actually need to have solar if I don't want to. This will just charge as a DC to DC converter from the alternator and the starter battery. Whenever the engine's running, it'll charge up my house battery and I can use the house battery to run whatever I want. So in that way, solar is like a little additional extra that I can add whenever I feel like it. And then the only other two things to connect, I mentioned that this thing has temperature compensation. So what that means is, is you plug in a temperature sensor, which comes with the unit, it's this little guy, and it plugs in on the side here, where is it there, BTS, battery temperature sensor. I'm gonna plug that in, and then on the other end, it's got this little probe and they say to put that just near the battery or on top of the battery. That way it can sense the temperature that the battery is currently at. That's going to change how the unit actually charges the battery. And that way it'll be able to charge it optimally and extend the life of the battery. And then finally too, I said that it has a Bluetooth module. So this is the little Bluetooth module and it just has a little connector, like an ethernet connector from your computer. And I plug that in over here as well and stick the Bluetooth module any old where, I'll find somewhere to tuck it. And then we're gonna be able to connect to this with my phone. So I'll plug all of this stuff in. I need to finish up the battery end of things, put the Jeep battery back in and wire up those two terminals. Now that this end is all connected correctly, I can connect the other end to 12 volts and obviously nothing bad is going to happen. So a couple of little things to finish off. So 
there we go, the system is completely wired up. And uh, Dad and I also just ran some wires from here, from my fuse block. I've actually run wires. I went down through one of the drain plugs in the tub and I zip tied it all the way along the chassis underneath the Jeep. And back here in the bed, this is where I'm gonna have power for my fridge, for a drinking water pump, for some lights, things like that. So all of that's already pre-wired now, all done. And obviously the whole charge controller is wired up as well. And it's just sitting here ready to go. So there's really only one way to find out if I've done everything correctly. Let's fire up the Jeep. And at that point with the engine running, the alternator should kick in and start charging that house battery. And the DC to DC charge controller is going to convert all of that and do everything that it needs to do. And so I'll fire up the Jeep. And one of the features I really love about this setup that I didn't mention yet, you'll notice the alternator light is not on yet on the charge controller. And that's because it has a built-in 15 second delay. So it's not actually going to start pulling current from the alternator until the engine's been running for 15 seconds. And again, I think that's a great feature. If it's a cold morning, you know, you don't want to load up your engine straight away, let it warm up a little bit, then it can start moving power and moving current. And so if we go and have a look right now, I'm sure the alternator light is on. And so that means right now we can see the lights on. That means now that it is pulling current from the alternator, from the starting battery to charge the house battery. But of course, what's the best way to monitor that? We do that off our phone because this thing has Bluetooth. So I'll grab the app now and I'll show you what that looks like. So here I've got the Renergy app open and when I add the device, which is the charge controller, here we get the info of everything the charge con controller is doing right now. So obviously it knows that I'm running a lithium battery. It tells me that the house battery is at 14.4 right now and the starter battery is at 13.6. And obviously the starter is reading that height because the engine's on, so the alternator's turning. We can see too, straight away it says starter battery amps is 27.5. So what that means is the setup is pulling 27 and a half amps out of the alternator to put it into the house battery. And it's putting 24 and a half amps into the house battery right now. So it's doing its internal conversions, whatever it does to bring up voltage or bring down current. And that's how much it's currently putting into the house battery. Obviously right now from solar, we're not getting any charge. Not surprising because there's no solar panels plugged in right now. And combined from the starter battery uh, the alternator and from the solar panels, right now we're moving in 353 watts of energy. And that is a lot. And you can see we've already generated 0 0.042 kilowatt hours. And the system can also tell me the temperature of the house battery and the temperature of the unit itself. And the unit itself is already climbing because obviously it's doing all of this massive power conversion. So right here, I can see everything that's happening in the system. And this is gonna be great on a sunny day. I'll be able to come in here and see what the solar's doing. And I'll definitely give you an update once I connect the solar panels for real. Another really nifty thing you can do in here, I've been playing around a little bit, I can get a history. So per month, you can see how much did you generate from solar, how much, how low did the battery get, how high did the battery get, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really great way to see what's been going on with your system as well over a period of time. So there it is, that is the complete install of what I'm calling 21st century dual isolated batteries with solar charging. And you can see it's a little bit involved to run the wires and get everything set up, but overall it's relatively simple and then it just works. And so already I can see charging that house battery at 30 amps, that is so much more current being pushed into the battery than my old setup that I had for Africa. So I have absolute confidence this is going to charge my battery so much more efficiently and so much better than my old setup. And of course, as well as that, soon enough I'll mount the solar panel and whenever this thing is parked, whether I'm buying fuel, whether I'm at a grocery store or I'm out on a hike, this is just sitting here charging my battery even without the engine running. So I'm really stoked on this setup. And as I said, I'm working with Renergy Solar. And if you're interested in any part of this setup, 
There's a link in the description, head over there and with the checkout code of TRCM, you'll get 10% discount on everything I've talked about today. So the solar panels, the wiring, obviously the charge controller, the Bluetooth module, all of that stuff. So that charge controller right now you can buy for $225, which I think is a screaming bargain considering the other options on the market they start at $1,000 and pretty quickly get up to $2,500. So check it out, Renergy Solar. And if you've got any questions or if there's anything I didn't explain, please do ask down in the comments below. I will try my best to answer and get back to you. And on that, if there's more broad questions about my build, about what I'm up to, what's coming next, what I'm planning, all of that and behind the scenes content I'm posting on Patreon right now. So the names on the screen here, these people, they're all supporting me over on Patreon. They're helping me bring these videos to life to document everything that I'm doing and to give you all of this information and teach you how to get out there and have your own massive overland adventures. I'm doing my best to give all the information and all that expertise that I learned. Most of it I learned the hard way. Hopefully I can teach you guys so you don't have to learn the hard way. And that's all over on Patreon right now, starting at just $5 a month. You'll be helping to get me on the road, helping to bring these videos to life, and you'll get a ton of behind the scenes content and access to me. You can ask me any question you want about your trip. If you're planning a trip to South America, if you wanna head up to Alaska for the summer, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one video call and we'll discuss everything from your vehicle choice to the length of your trip, to camping, the season, safety, money, whatever it is you'd like to learn more about, Let's have a one-on-one -on -one video chat and I'll help you with everything I've learned along the way. So that's on Patreon. There's a link in the description. Renergy Solar, this whole setup, I think is cutting edge and the best of the best. And you can check that out, link in the description. And of course, thanks again very much for watching. If it's been helpful, if you're learning a ton from this Gladiator build series, do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. I'm bringing out new videos every Monday and every Thursday. And I'm just now lining up the next items that need to go on here. So plenty more to come in this series. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and maybe I'll bump into you on the road. While I'm here too, a couple of features that my setup will not have because of my personal thoughts and feelings. And the first one is, I don't have any way to connect outside electricity into this system. So some units you can plug in from your wall outlet, from your PowerPoint, you can plug in well, it's 110 volts AC if you're in North America. It's 240 volts AC if you're here in Australia. You can plug that in and it will use that as a charging source to charge your house battery. And I think that's an interesting feature, but it's not one that I'm ever gonna use for a couple of reasons. The first one is that I design my vehicles to be global. And even though I'm not going global on this particular trip, I think it's good to stay in that practice, that mentality, because I want my next trip to be global. And if you're going global, the first thing is electricity standards are different all over the world. And so while your system might be great on 110 volts, if you go and drive around Africa, you'll come to a few countries that use 240 volts. You can't plug it in unless you bring a voltage transformer, which is yet another big heavy box that's inefficient, that uses power, that has fans to keep it cool. That's not something I'm interested in. Even while staying in Australia, I'm not too interested in shore power because I wanna be out remote. I wanna be camping in the middle of the Simpson Desert. Of course there's no power out there. So why design a system that needs power or that can even have power? I think it's better to design a system that meets my needs when I'm out in the wilderness. And then when I'm even in town, I simply don't need to plug into power, which will save me money. Because even when I'm paying for campgrounds, unpowered sites are a lot cheaper than powered sites. So if my whole system doesn't need power, why would I pay money to have it? This is gonna make my budget stretch further so I can have more adventures. And it's more convenient because I don't have to carry around big long extension leads. I don't have to always be trying to find somewhere to plug in because I don't need to plug in. Along those same lines, my setup is not going to have an inverter. So an inverter is just another type of voltage transformer and it transforms the electricity that's in your vehicle, which is DC power, into the kind of power that comes out of your wall outlet or your power point, which is AC power. So what it means is if you have an inverter in your vehicle, you can plug in anything that you plug in at home. You could even bring a microwave if you really wanted to. But in terms of like laptop charges, all of that, 
you can just plug them in as if you're at home. The thing I don't like about inverters though is that they're big, they usually have a cooling fan, they're quite inefficient. When they transform power like that, they lose some percentage of power and you wind up with a single source of failure. So if your inverter dies, you can't now charge or use everything you were relying on to plug into it. And again, if you're in Australia, yeah, you can run to the nearest Bunnings and replace it. But remember, design and build your vehicle for the kinds of trips you dream of. Trust me, when you're in the Congo, you're not going to be able to replace your inverter. So for me, I'm just not going to have an inverter. And that means that all of my charges for everything that I carry, they run straight on 12 volts. Or in fact, these days, nearly all of them just plug into USB. So I'm gonna have a whole bunch of USB outlets in my charging station where I can plug in charges for my camera, my GoPro, my drone, even my laptop can all just charge straight off USB. Why would I even want regular house power in my vehicle? I don't need it, therefore I can save space, I can save weight and I can save complexity. So that's what I'm gonna do by not even having an inverter.